That would be wonderful. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market in Delhi. Today's special guest that we have with us is Laura Matter. She is one of the Garden Hotline educators and has a wonderful topic to share with us this morning. Summer tasks in your edible and ornamental garden. Thank you so much, Laura. Great. How's everybody seeing this? Is it coming through yet? It is loading. <gasps> Perfect. All right. Awesome. So I forget what number we're on here, Elizabeth. We've done a few this spring already and summer. We're doing these every other month. Um, and so they're seasonal topics, um, but we cover um, a little bit different thing each time about, you know, what's important to be thinking about in the garden. And this uh, session is no different. Uh, we're going to be talking about what you do in the summer um, with an um, sort of a, a mind to can you be planting more things now? Uh, what about water? Uh, how do you water? And then also seed saving um, thoughts, because now's the time when you may need to save plants that you want to save seeds from uh, instead of harvesting them. And so uh, we'll be looking at that. The next, there's two more topics after this, I believe. One is the next one coming is about protecting your soil over the winter and uh, fall tasks. And so some of what we talk about today will sort of lead to those topics uh, and we won't delve too deeply into them today just to sort of get you set up for that. Oops. All right, so first I wanna talk about just understanding that your garden is habitat. This is just a little brief um, idea uh, exploration that I'd like to share with people. We do do talks that are just about habitat and how to create habitat for wildlife and beneficial insects. We'll talk a little bit about things as we go today, but basically understanding that even um, a small space in your garden can be considered habitat. So for instance, thinking about scale, different garden beds. If you have a raised bed in your garden you're growing vegetables in, that can be a world of its own to whatever's inhabiting it. So little critters that live in there, um, you know, that's where they live and that they don't, they don't necessarily interact with the rest of your yard. So everywhere we're working in our garden can be considered habitat. And then as a whole, of course, our whole garden is a bigger space and so bigger scale. And then we also want to make sure that people are thinking about how do you fit into the broader um, habitat around you. The more of us that create habitat that's healthy and um, supportive of wildlife and beneficial insects, pollinators, and ourselves in our gardens, the more uh, habitat there is overall. Part of what happens with wildlife is that they um, lose ways to move through. A landscape and they need to have corridors um, connecting things and so in urban environments this can be very important for us all to be creating. I also want to think about we'll talk about soil a little bit um, but soil life so if there are things going on in the soil that's also a type of habitat so we want to make sure that people are really um, improving their soil and keeping it healthy and, and not compacting it because what's going on underneath the soil is, is super important. All, all the plant roots live there. There's a lot of microorganisms um, that are in the soil and we want all that to be protected. And then if we're talking about vegetables, uh, it's important to understand that most of the vegetables we grow in our gardens are non-native plants. There are many things you can grow that are native that are edible, but the typical things that you'll see like you know beets and Swiss chard and lettuces and you know collard greens and some of the things that you see in these pictures here these are not native to the northwest and as such then they have they also have issues that can happen to them that we have to be paying attention to and be on the lookout for um things like uh swiss chard are in the uh spinach family and there's particular insects that like them 
of the collard family, same thing. So cabbage family, the, those are two of the types of plants that we're going to see more um, issues with. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So when we're thinking about scale, um, I like this little um, quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes that on every stem, every on every leaf, and the root at the root of everything that grew was a professional specialist in the shape of grub, caterpillar, aphid, or other expert whose business it was to devour that particular part. And so, you know, remembering that, um, you know, life in the garden includes life of critters that might be causing harm to your plants. But on the other hand, there is also um, awareness that if you want to have butterflies in your garden, they have caterpillars as well. And those caterpillars need to eat something. So something like a monarch butterfly, for instance, will lay her eggs on a milkweed plant. That is where they lay their eggs. That plant gets eaten, but it's our job to grow it so that it becomes, you know, a home for those, um, those larvae. And that's part of life in the garden. Um, we try to intervene if there's, you know, issues where we're getting too much damage or if it's, um, affecting something like a collard plant that we want to eat and we want to get the benefit of. Um, but understanding that this is a whole um, ecosystem that we are creating and that, um, the, as I said, this can happen on all kinds of levels. Um, this tree that you see in this photo is a um, tree that no longer exists. It was an elm tree at the edge of a yard um, on the pathway that leads into Picardo Farm Pea Patch in Northeast Seattle. This is the original pea patch in the pea patch program in Seattle. And that had, um, it had some issues like Dutch elm disease, which is why it was cut down. But one of the things that happened with this plant is it had leaf miner on it. And so every spring you'd see it leaf out fully and then you'd see the leaves get attacked by this, this insect. Um, and it didn't spread to other plants because it was particular to that tree. So, um, you know, there are lots of lessons to be learned about how nature works. Um, and then also I use this picture to show that trees can cause a lot of shade. This is a wintertime picture, but even then it's causing shade on the garden across the pathway. Um, when it was fully leafed out, that was an incredibly shady space. And so um, tall trees, buildings, uh, we hear a lot about people who um, have condos be built next to them or a tall townhouse and all of a sudden their backyard now has shade in it. So we impact each other with our actions um, and we can help mitigate that by, you know, planting what's going to thrive in those areas and then also make sure that we are um, integrating our garden into the um, rest of the yard that we have, and then into the landscape around us, as I said. So here's what we're talking about in um, detail today. So we're going to talk about uh, how to have a healthy summer garden, essentially. Um, first of all, you want to protect your soil from drought and heat, and this in turn will protect your plants, of course, and keep them healthy. healthy. You want to manage problematic weeds, and we can talk a little bit about what that might be. Um, you want to identify if you have pests or disease issues early on when you first start seeing them. There are ways to mitigate that. There's also ways to step back and let nature take its course um, by letting beneficial insects manage things or um, doing minimal um, pruning on something that might have a disease. And then, you know, you need to know when something's serious enough to, to either pull the plant or have some other alternative um, control method. And it's super important to have a good watering routine. There's many ways to water. We're gonna talk about water quite a bit. And then of course, because we're doing all this, especially with an edible garden, um, so we can eat our food, we wanna know when to harvest. So there's different harvest points for different vegetables and fruits, depending on what you're trying to grow. Um, they can, harvest can happen all the way from April through, you know, December, really, depending on what you're growing, even, even over the winter. And then we're going to talk about how to prepare now for fall and over winter gardening, because you have to be planting things. Now, we, we kind of get through June and think, oh, our garden's planted, but then July hits and August, and, and there are still things we can do to continue our crops and 
to put in things where we've already pulled something or to put in something that can overwinter and be um, <clears throat> an earlier spring crop next year. So let's talk about soil first. So soil is composed of mineral, organic content, and then it also has air, water, and microorganisms. And it's not fully soil unless all of that is present. Um, it's important to mulch the surface of your garden beds this time of year, and it's important to add compost as needed to enrich soil. So Wendell Berry is an um, a environmentalist who um, is from the Midwest and has been very instrumental in inspiring people to um, work with soil and make soil um, uh, sort of a priority for healthy farms and gardens. He was the inspiration for how tilth um, became a phenomenon on the West Coast. So Seattle tilth, Oregon tilth, Whidbey tilth, um, tilth producers of Washington all were born out of um, a conference that happened in the 1970s. Um, and so in 1977, um, he came to the Northwest and did this conference in the, in, around that time. And then in 1979, Seattle Tilth was created and it was an urban um, agriculture uh, organization. Now we're Tilth Alliance. So the Garden Hotline is managed by Tilth Alliance. It's a program that is sponsored by Seattle Public Utilities and the Hazardous Waste Management Program so that we can teach people about natural gardening techniques. Um, and Wendell Berry inspired this whole movement, built all these, all these Tilth organizations were built and now Tilth Alliance is a um, a combination of Tilt Producers of Washington, Seattle Tilt, and Cascade Harvest Coalition. So we work with folks who work um, with consumers, um, the whole CSA movement, farms across Washington state. We work with backyard gardeners. We work with children and adults to educate. And um, we also help connect consumers to um, healthy organic foods. So if healthy soil is full of death, it's also full of life, worms, fungi, microorganisms of all kinds. Given only the health of the soil, nothing that dies is dead for very long. And you know, this is basically life. We see things that die and get recycled and become part of soil. So the organic content that is in our soil, of course, is, is that. It is things that have died and been recycled. This could be animal matter as well as plant matter. And as a gardener, typically we're working with mostly animal matter, but we also work with manures and different things. Um, mulching is super important because at this time of year in particular, it helps to conserve moisture and it cools your soil. So you don't want your soils to be too warm. It's stressful for plants. Some plants prefer a little bit warmer soil so you can manipulate what kind of mulch you use. Some mulches will reflect light more than others. Some will absorb um, sun, sunlight. So like a dark compost used as a mulch can actually warm up the soil a little bit more than straw, for instance, which will um, reflect light. But tomatoes, peppers, things like that prefer a little bit warmer soil and then cool weather crops like you see in that top left photo. Those guys like it a little cooler, but to be honest, our soils don't get super hot in the summer. So, you know, mulching is used to cool soil, but also primarily this time of year to keep weeds down and to conserve moisture. Super helpful to keep your weeds down as well. Um, you can see a bunch of different types of mulch in these pictures. So three of them are edible gardens, but you can use those same materials in an ornamental setting in a in a garden bed if you want to. Burlap is used a lot to just sort of smother things and you know start a new bed if you want to do that. Um, you can use cardboard, for instance, to smother out grass if you're trying to create a new garden bed. Um, we call that sheet mulching. You put down cardboard and then you put down wood chips on top of it and that kills the grass. It causes it to die and then that gets recycled into the soil underneath. So you're not losing anything. It saves you labor. You don't have to dig it out and you're also helping to improve your soil at the same time, it loosens it up. On the bottom picture where the lavender is, that's all wood chips, so perennial beds, tree and shrub beds uh, really benefit from wood chip mulch, which has a lot of um, 
nutrients in it um, as it breaks down. It's very helpful for the soil and also will help with soil structure over time. And sometimes even digging in a little wood can help gardens. A lot of times people use a method called Hugel culture where they put um, pruning stem, um, stems and twigs and um, pieces of trees and shrubs that you prune into um, a long berm and then pile compost and soil into that and put, you can plant directly in. And a lot of microorganisms, especially fungal colonies, build in that wood and that wood absorbs water and helps the soil stay wet and, and instead of drying out so fast. So that's also culture can be a really good technique for keeping your garden well watered with little input of water because the water that you do use gets stored on site and then slowly dispensed to the soil. Um, leaves, if you have them in your garden, those are big leaf maple leaves that you see around all those veggie, veggies in that raised bed. Um, you can break those up. If you have a lawnmower, you can run over them and make them finer and make a better leaf mold out of that. But leaves by themselves can be very useful. The only time you want to be careful with leaves is if you have disease issues in fruit trees, for instance, you might want to clean those up and take them out because that, lo that lessens the load of um, fungal spores that might be present. And then straw is a really useful tool for um, overwintering mulches and then um, putting around your vegetables. This would be the case where I've used straw around tomatoes, but they prefer darker mulches, but this straw is great around um, cool weather crops because it's a lighter mulch and reflects some light and heat, and but it works wonderfully to keep the soil moist. Um, you want to be careful to be buying straw that's um, healthy, you know, and you don't want hay because hay has seeds in it and you're going to grow crops of whatever that hay grass is. So you're looking for straw, which is the base of grain plants that have been cut down already to make hay, and then they use that bottom piece um, to recycle in this way. Wood chips can be found through arborists, and there's an organization called Chip Drop um, that you can sign up for chips, but you want to be aware that when you get chips from an arborist, you're often going to get um, many, many yards, sometimes as many as 10 yards. You have to have a place to dump them, and you have to have a way to use them all. In my neighborhood, I'm in Del Ridge area in, in uh, West Seattle, and I just keep an eye out on the neighborhood blogs and next door and the Facebook pages to, and the Buy Nothing pages to see who has wood chips because I don't have a big enough yard. I have a big enough yard, but I don't have a big enough open space. Um, everything's pretty planted. And so I need wood chips sometimes, but I certainly don't need 10 yards. So adding compost to your garden, even this time of year, a lot of times you'll see, oh, you add compost as you're you know, planting, which is true, um, but you could be planting now, but it's also can be used as a mulch. And even the act of laying compost on top of the soil can enrich soil because all the microorganisms, even worms, you know, which are macroorganisms, will come up and pull the compost into the soil because they're feeding off of it. There's still matter there to decay. So anything that is a, um, you know, a um, organism that will decay, use plants and animals and, and biodegrade them, uh, will th that will still be present in compost, even if it's finished compost. So that gets used up. And as these critters use it up, they actually provide nutrient to your plants. So it's their work that's actually feeding your plants. Um, and we'll talk about this when we look at water. Water moves the nutrients into the plant, but without the help of the microorganisms, the plants can't access very much, um, which is why fertilizers were created to make that a little more readily available. And with vegetable gardens, fertilizers are not a terrible idea, but you don't always need to um, add fertilizer if you have good, healthy soil. So what you're seeing here is, you know, finished compost, commercial piles of compost. Um, on the left and they're being loaded into wheelbarrow and then compost that people make at home. You can see a lot of leaf mold in there. Um, sometimes you can just create a pile of leaves, break them up and keep turning them. And they make this beautiful um, compost that can be used to dig into beds or can be used as a top mulch on top of a bed. 
And then on the bottom, you can actually just chop and drop things that you're trimming in the garden. And I use this method a lot when I used to have a pea patch because my pea patch was that I was at Picardo, which is that original garden I showed you the photo of. And I, it's, a, it's a four acre site. I was at the north end of the garden, the, the um, closest um, compost bins were at the, a complete other end of the garden. And so I was lazy and I didn't want to take it all the way down there. And I knew that I could just cut them into small pieces and just lay them in the, on the soil around my plants. And that actually provides um, a mulch, which biodegrades and then becomes um, compost in your soil. Or you can dig them into your soil if you want to. So you can use the things if you're trimming, for instance, if you're picking a head of lettuce and you're pulling the plant entirely, say it's a um, romaine or a butterhead and you want the full head and you don't want to cut it and see if it'll grow again, which you can do, especially with leaf lettuces. But if you don't want to do that and you're just pulling the thing, you just take the roots and cut them into little pieces and all those bad leaves that you're not going to eat, you just trim them all into little pieces and you lay them right back on top of the soil. Super easy, um, super fast, um, saves you lots of time and um, will enrich your soil all by itself. You can also plant things that are, are considered mulching. So, you know, there is such a thing as a cover crop that's planted in the fall, which we'll talk about at the next class um, in um, October, but cover cropping can be done in multiple ways. So you can do summer cover crops that are targeted like phacelia and buckwheat. And in this bottom picture of the farm, that's phacelia growing in a field. This is a super, wonderful plant for bees. They love this plant. So you can just plant this and let it bloom. It enriches the soil. Stuff gets tilled in eventually. And um, that helps improve the soil by adding organic matter to this back to the soil and improves the soil structure. But the flowers themselves are super pollinator attractors. Um, buckwheat's the same way. And these are great choices for summer weather, summer months when these are warmer seasoned crops. In the winter, we grow a lot of um, pea family and cereal crops, uh, which we'll talk about the next class, but there are um, many things you can do during the summer. And there's those are only two that I um, really love, but there's lots of other choices. Um, in the top picture, you see some Swiss chard and some echinacea growing. There's a bunch of alyssum growing around the base of it. And so this is a method where somebody's done this as an ornamental garden but it's edible. And actually all those things are edible. The echinacea is, is you know, used as a medicinal plant. Um, the chard is of course edible. And then the lissum is actually in the cabbage family. And so it can be eaten if you wanna eat those flowers too. Also good pollinator attractor also smells heavenly. So it has a wonderful fragrance. Um, it covers the ground well. You can get packets of seeds of this and just scatter them and let it grow or buy little six packs early in the um, summer and plant them. They, white is sort of the traditional color, but there's also pinks and purples and they spread really well. So one little plant will actually take up quite a bit of space and you can um, think of these as a summer cover crop because they are helping to keep the soil cool, helping to keep moisture in and helping to keep weeds down, just like um, mulches, other types of mulches do. Um, and they flower all summer long. Lobelia is another one of those that people usually just put in a flower pot, but that can also be used in the same way. It grows low, it grows thickly, and it fills out and it blooms and it's beautiful all summer long. And the bees love that too. You can also use something like cilantro, which uh, has a very short season for coming to maturity. So it's like a, a month and a half maybe. And you can continually seed that. It's It does better in cooler weather. So sometimes in the mid part of summer, you need to give it a little TLC to get it to germinate. But if you keep a little bit germinating continually through the summer, you're gonna have this um, understory um, cover of plants super attractive to pollinators. If you like cilantro, of course you can eat it. Um, I'm one of those people that tastes soapy too, so I don't eat the leaf of the plant as 
too much, I, I will tolerate it, but I'm not growing it typically to eat. However, I love coriander and the seed of this plant is coriander. You can let it self seed and it will grow itself again. And so you may always have it in your garden once you get it established. It's not a pest, it's not gonna be problematic, but it will actually um, be a beneficial plant for you and the garden. And you can see the little bee uh, landing there. The cilantro flowers are really beautiful. It's very lacy, it's a beautiful plant. Um, and all of these can be used as a summer type of uh, cover crop. Um, this is especially useful if you are <clears throat> trying to rehab a bed in your garden. Say you have a raised bed that you feel like the soil hasn't been very productive and maybe you've got you know, your early crops out of there, your mustards and radishes. Maybe it's had a lot of things in that family. The cabbage family can have issues with a root crop a root disease called uh, club root. And so you want to give the soil a rest, you can just plant a whole bunch of different summer cover crops in there and let it bloom, be a pollinator bed, but also know that you're improving your soil and protecting your soil and rehabbing it for the summer. All right, so we're going to talk now about like, how do you manage things? Um, you know, this time of year where things are happening, things are harvesting, we're seeing a lot of insects, we see animals, we see weeds. What are they all? And I didn't show you the whole gamut of everything that's going to be happening out there. Um, everybody has their specialties, which we can talk about when, after we're uh, finished looking at the slides, um, talk specifically about your issues. But these three are big ones for this time of year. The cottontail, eastern cottontail rabbit has become a bigger issue than it's been in the past. Um, they wax and wane depending on the coyote population, you know, which of course, you know, has its own um, concerns that people have about their, their pets um, and your children, of course. They're typically not going to um, like bother us, but um, we live with all these animals. And so this is to show that there's insect issues that we're coping with. There's um, animal issues that we cope with in the garden, mammals and birds. Um, and then there's lots of weeds and the weeds that are really the things we should be um, managing the most and highly focused on are those things that are noxious weeds and perennial and um, really persistent things. So bindweed, uh, which we call morning glory, is one of those. There's field bindweed and hedge bindweed, and they both have this white flower, one of them smaller flower than the other, sometimes a little pink tint. And this is not the same as the ornamental morning glory that people grow like the grandpa ots with the deep, deep purple flowers or the sky blue morning glories. Those can seed um, themselves. They don't become a pest in the garden, but they may fall, seeds may fall into the pot you grew in them or the bed you grew them in, you'll get more next year, which is what's happening in my yard. But I only get those that seeded right around the plant and then I don't have to plant them again. Um, so that's a benefit to me. It's like having that cilantro self-seed or alyssum will self-seed um, in the garden. But these are all things that we um, need to pay attention to. Other things that are happening this time of year are things like um, knotweed and um, we see um, horsetail. Um, those are really difficult plants. Um, there's a lot of different techniques to try and outsmart them. Sometimes you have to mulch, mulch, mulch. And with bindweed in particular, if you do a really heavy mulch, it helps to pull all the underground stems. We call those rhizomes. They aren't technically roots. The roots are the hairs that come off the stem, but they grow higher in the soil because they're trying to surface since we buried them. And then when you pull that mulch back, you can get two more of those rhizomes and get a lot more of it out. Um, there are sometimes, you know, cases where it makes sense to use a little bit of herbicide, carefully cautionary, um, you know, measures uh, protecting yourself and not spraying it, but actually painting it on things, especially if it's all on a chain link fence. But you, you want to be careful. You want to read the label. You want to really do this correctly and try to eradicate it so you don't have to keep using um, 
herbicides. Herbicides can be really um, dangerous for human beings to use. Then they, they also um, get into groundwater. <clears throat> so in the Northwest, we see a lot of herbicide residue because that's the primary pesticide that people are using rather than things to kill insects um, or, or even diseases. We see more weed killer than anything. And then of course, our friend on the right here is happily doing its thing right now. This is a butterfly. It's not a moth. People call it a cabbage moth. It's not a moth, it's a butterfly. You can tell a butterfly it has the knobs on the antenna, so you can see that on it. Uh, it's a day flyer. Most moths are night, not all of them, but most. And this guy actually pollinates. I've seen it pollinating on lavender and all kinds of things. It, it's a, you know, can be a good guy, but it has these caterpillars that you see on that cabbage on top that are super destructive to things like kale and collards and cabbage and broccoli and kohlrabi and anything in that family. In particular, these really thick, juicy leaves, they can get on mustard greens and radish. They're not as particular as those. They like these smooth, thick leaves the best and they are way more food for them. And of course, the problem with that is we're trying to eat those same leaves. And so they're causing damage on them and can really riddle kale full of holes so that you have this leaf that just looks like Swiss cheese and you don't have much to eat after they've gotten hold of them. So this is the young of the of the butterfly. Um, and then the eggs on the left are um, what you're going to see on the underside of the leaf. So you want to be knowing what eggs look like for the pests that you're trying to manage. You also want to know what eggs look like for the beneficial insects that you're trying to grow. Uh, or trying to encourage in your garden because you don't want to disappear those. And this is a good, uh, sort of a good um, caution about spraying pesticides or uh, insecticides to kill insects. First of all, the, the butterfly is hard to, um, the adult is hard to capture with a spray. So it's not really worth your time and energy. The caterpillars you can kill, but, um, you know, they're harder to find. And so you're ending, you end up spraying the whole plant and now you have pesticides all over the food you're trying to eat. And then the eggs, um, if you find them, it's easier just to pull them off than it is to try and spray something on them uh, because you can just get rid of them all in one fell swoop and it's a done deal. But the best thing you can do is put something like a floating row cover, the white fabric that lets air, light and water through on top of these plants when you plant them and it prevents that adult butterfly from me being able to lay her eggs on your plant. This is also true for leaf miner which gets on spinach and chard and beets and it's a fly that will lay eggs and those look like little tiny specks of rice that are laid kind of in uh, clusters on the back of the leaf. So get to know who your who your pests are what their life cycle is, where to interrupt it. Um, and there's many things you can do to prevent you from having to use um, any kind of sprays in your garden um, and, and just stay on top of it. These imported cabbage worm butterflies are around from April through October. Um, they have multiple generations, used to be about two per year in the Northwest. We're seeing more than that now with the weather being you know warmer, um, earlier and later. And um, so, you know, they're here to stay. They have their own purpose. Um, they do provide food for birds as well. Birds are great to uh, welcome to your yard because they can help with this. But get to know which things you're dealing with and how. Um, when we're talking about mammals, um, those are individual conversations to be had with each person to talk about what mammal is bothering their garden, or, or if it's a bird, sometimes birds can be um, problematic because there are different ways to sort of um, put barriers up to keep them out of the garden. Rabbits are difficult, um, moles are difficult, and mammals are probably the hardest thing to manage, um, but understanding their, their needs um, can help uh, we had a garden out in Issaquah that Tilth used to manage at the Pickering Barn, and we had deer that came in there, and uh, we built very skinny little, we had skinny beds with skinny little fences around them to try to keep the rabbits out, which seemed to work. 
we had beds that had onions in them around the plants and they didn't go into those beds. We had beds with cloching over it with the, the floating row cover and they didn't like going in the tunnels. Um, and we also grew a bed that was at the edge of the garden that we let them eat. And so there were ways to sort of coexist with them. The deer couldn't get to the uh, produce because it wasn't like a fence they could jump. It was just the skinny little bed. And so we managed to outsmart both of them out there by doing those very simple things. So there's ways to do it, but it depends on your garden setting and how you're growing things. So here's some of the heroes that we see, beneficial insects and animals. We see um, birds can be super important. Um, chickadees are great because they feed their young uh, a diet, 100% insect diet. And um, I don't have a picture of them here, but I think most of us have seen black capped and the brown, the brown chickadees. And hummingbirds pollinate plants, but they also eat insects. Um, bush tits forage in groups um, and they're fierce little, you can see the little look on this bush tit down in the bottom, the little fierce little birds. They look like those little angry birds in the cartoon to me. Um, ground beetles, which people get you know, there's an ick factor that happens with insects, of course, but ground beetles are good guys. They eat slug and snail eggs and young. And so we want to encourage them. You can have like um, grass plant, native grass um, plantings that they live in, good mulch. They love mulchy areas. They like to hide. And then they'll come out and eat slugs and snails um, when you're not watching. And so you want to encourage those guys and not hurt them. Um, and lady beetles, of course, everybody knows the lady beetles. They are voracious predators, especially for aphids. So um, this insect and the one at the bottom, parasitoid wasp, are really important to protect. And these guys can be harmed by sprays pretty, um, pretty dramatically. They lay their eggs um, on the same plant that the aphids are on. And in fact, the parasitoid wasp, she lays her eggs inside the aphid. And so if you're spraying aphids that have been parasitized, you are killing the young of the wasp, which is actually killing the aphids for you. So if you give it a minute, you'll see them reduce the numbers if you see these guys present. And these little parasitoid wasps are out as early as April also, even before we see the aphids start, they know they're there and they're looking for them. Lady beetle larvae are those little alligator looking guys. People call the hotline all the time thinking these are bad guys. These are good guys and they are eating. Those little front um, pinchers will they'll grab the aphid and they'll actually suck the juices out of them. And the reason insects like this, like this lady beetle like aphids is aphids suck um, plant sugars out of the plant. And so in turn, these insects are getting the sugar that the aphid consumed. Um, so everybody's after the plant sugars, including us, because those are the carbohydrates that we eat when we're trying to harvest our crops. Um, but we wanna encourage all these guys. And then we also wanna plant the right kind of plants to attract the beneficial insects and to attract pollinators. We can't have our fruit without pollination unless you wanna hand pollinate everything. Um, so anything that's in the daisy, carrot, or mint family, are gonna be great additions. Good news is we're already planting all these. So APACA is carrot, Asteraceae is um, daisy, and Lamiaceae is mint. And in the mint family, you see the lavender in that bottom picture. Lavender plants in bloom right now covered in insects. Um, all kinds are attracted to these guys. Um, these guys are things like lavender, sage, thyme, rosemary, mint, um, germander, um, oregano, <coughs> marjoram. These are things we're growing anyway because they are um, Mediterranean herbs that we use in a culinary um, fashion and very popular in the garden anyway. So we already have them. So capitalize on that and have more and more of them. Put them near where all your plants are that have may have issues. Um, because that's going to make it easier for them to find. So you're 
beneficial insects to find them, but it also make it easier if you put it near your tomatoes to have flowering things near them rather than across the yard. They will still find them, but it's better to intersperse and mix, mix up. And then the, um, the uh, daisy family is huge and big and has, you know, all the flowers that we cut. Many of these are also edible, so you can eat dahlia flowers. You can take those petals and pull them apart and throw them in a salad. Just do it last minute so they don't wilt up too fast. Very colorful, tastes like lettuce, literally. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the um, APACA or the carrot family, there's a million different herbs in this family as well. You want to be aware that there are some poisonous plants in the um, carrot family, like poison hemlock and giant hogweed. Giant hogweed has oils in the plant that if it gets on your skin and interacts with sunlight can burn you very badly. Parsnip can actually also do that. That's happened to my sister last summer. She harvested all her parsnip on a really hot day last summer and didn't think about it and had sleeveless shirt and shorts, sandals, and she had it bundled in her arm and the oils got onto her skin and she had burns that months to heal. Um, so you want to protect yourself, know which plants are going to, you know, be problematic. Sometimes carrot is irritating to some people, but it's not going to burn you like a parsnip will. Um, but you can let something like your carrot go to seed. You can leave a couple to go to seed and um, go to flower for the next season. They are biennial and they will bloom in the second year. Parsley, fennel, dill, sweet sicily, um, ton of plants, lovage. Um, angelica, um, things like cumin, um, fun, interesting herbs are in this family. And, you know, these are all useful edible and uh, medicinal plants, as well as they bloom and attract pollinators and make us happy as well, have scent. All right, let's talk about water. So water is crucial for plant health and of course for our health too. We can get water out of plants and fruits that we eat. You know, when you eat watermelon, of course, cantaloupe melons are full of water. Uh, plants are 80 to 95% water in their cells. So they have their cell structures a little different than a, an animals. Um, they have these cell vacuoles full of water. Water is carried from the root system up into the plant and then also dispersed throughout the plant. Um, uh, nutrients coming from the roots and also sugars that the plant is making for itself through the process of photosynthesis. So sunlight will hit the plant, water's coming up, the hydrogen and um, coming up through the roots, and then the carbon dioxide that the plant is breathing in takes in through its stomata or the pores that open up on the leaf, usually on the underside of the leaf to protect them. Um, those open and close in response to water flooding um, with potassium, and that actually causes the cell to sort of curve and pops the cell, the stomata open, and then carbon dioxide gets into the plant, and then the plant um, has react this chemical reaction that happens between the hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and sun coming in and hitting the chlorophyll in the cell. So there's this huge chemical. Um, factory that's going on. When you look at a tree, you know, I do this every day. I probably do this. I look at a tree and I think about all of the millions of chlorophyll cells that are in that tree that are doing this interaction and making this happen. It enables us to live. You know, it feeds the animals that we eat. It feeds the plants that we eat. Um, it actually provides oxygen, air for us, keeps the air healthy. Um, uh, the, the transpiration from the leaves of water goes back into the sky and helps to provide, um, you know, moisture that comes back down in the form of rain. So this whole, the hydrological cycle is super important. Uh, it's important for us to keep it clean, to think about those pesticides that we're, we're spraying that get into water because we really don't want that everywhere. We don't want it to kill the salmon. We don't want it, which in turn affects orca. Um, you know, all of the things that we do in our garden matter. Um, and water is like crucial for all of these um, processes. Uh, plants stand up, especially something, if you think about a sunflower, it's kind of got a hollow stem. 
um, it stands up because of the hydraulic um, system of water moving up the plant. It's turgor pressure that actually keeps it upright. So it's important to be able to have enough water for plants so they don't wilt, they don't fall over. They, ha they have um, cells that are strong um, and um, can um, keep the plant functioning, keep the, the uh, leaves holding uh, uh, held out to get light so that they can actually photosynthesize. It's quite quite an interesting process. If you you know if you studied botany at all, you'll you know these are things that you learn about um, all the chemical reactions that happen and all the physio physiological um, and morphology of plants that um, are important to be able to make this a, a thing and keep us all, all alive. So in the Northwest, um, and if you've seen the talks that we did earlier this year, I've used these charts a couple of times, but um, I, I think it's really striking to look at it now because today is August 5th and we're looking at this chart on the left that shows um, you know, the rainfall and how we, on, and it's showing August 5th and how we're at pretty much our lowest point right now. You know, So the reason, the Blue Angels are here this weekend. The Seafair uh, event is this weekend, and the hydroplanes are here is because this is statistically the driest time of the year in the Pacific Northwest. And so we are, of course, you know, needing to make sure our plants are well watered. You'll see this chart has, if you look back to the left into June, you'll see a little bit of a bump you know, where it kind of levels, you see it dropping from March through May, but then in June, it, you know, we get a little more moisture. Well, that's starting to change. Most of our Junes lately have been drier, and this has been kind of important for our Northwest climate and for our forests in particular to be able not just to keep the, you know, the brush moisture and, you know, have less fire hazard, but also to keep our trees healthy because, they get this June, we get the June gloom, they don't photosynthesize, uh, you know, they don't transpire quite as much. They save water, water recharges in the soil, and that gets us through this dry period, July, August to September. Um, because you can see from, you know, beginning of July to September, we're in this valley. Um, so sometimes now it's important to think about checking even big trees in your yard. You might want to water if you have a cedar and do a couple of deep soaks in August. Um, even July, maybe July, August and September do one a month just to give it a deep soaking because they are not getting the water recharged in the soil in June that they were in the past. Our lowest rainfall period um, goes through July and now through early August. And then um, when we get back to April and September, October, this is why people are putting grass, um, grasses in lawns um, those times of year because lawn is a cool season crop and it goes dormant this time of year. So you can stop watering a lawn, let it go dormant, and then you know the rain comes back and it'll green back up again. So if you have lawns, you know, be thinking about what their water needs are. If you're trying to keep it green and alive, then you need to water at least one inch a week to keep those alive. But you can see the temperatures also combine with the dry dryness. So not only do we not get a lot of rain right now, but we also have higher temperatures right now. And so on average, 78 degrees this time of year, um, you know, it's been a little warmer than that. Um, and that'll, that'll fluctuate a bit, um, but we're seeing warmer temperatures in June too, as well. So when do you water? Um, early morning is ideal. It's not always possible for those of us that are trying to get out of the house, go to work, we have a life, we have you know things to do, um, but as much as you can, um, early morning is ideal because if you're using overhead sprinklers like this rocking sprinkler, you know, the kind you can set to go either full or just part way over and come back up. Um, these are great for lawns in particular because they can cover a wide area, but they can also cover a nice big uh, bed of plants. But you don't want to do this late in the evening because you're getting your plants soaking wet. And as you go into the evening and 
temperature cools down, they're more susceptible to disease organisms if they stay wet through the evening time. Um, some of them too, um, things like powdery mildew uh, is a disease that's pretty prevalent this time of year when the weather gets humid, but also dry. So we have humidity in the air and then dry, but dry, dry, you know, and um, this spore can fly around and populate um, plants that are susceptible to it. And then powdery mildew is a common name for many, many organisms that have the same disease uh, mechanism. And so some plants are susceptible and some are not. And if something's on your squash plant, it's not necessarily gonna get or probably won't get on you know, the broccoli next to it because there are different disease organisms that affect that that are called powdery mildew. And so squash is very susceptible to this. We see this a lot this time of year. Um, so if you water at night, you're increasing that humidity at night and you're leaving it more humid for a longer period of time instead of drying off during the day. So less disease pressure. Uh, there's also less evaporation if you're doing it in a cooler time of the day in the morning. Um, and also um, more water pressure, uh, typically uh, in the mornings, if you're early enough. And then it also can hydrate the plant for the heat of the day. So it gets it ready to deal with the day instead of letting it get hot and feel kind of um, dehydrated until you water it that night. So there are also lots of ways to water. Um, you, a lot of people have built-in irrigation systems, which are great for shrub beds and lawns, and you can use timers and stations to adjust the watering. Um, the nice thing about that is um, you don't have to worry about it. You just set it up and um, let it do its thing. You could have overhead hose end sprinklers like the one we saw in the picture just before this slide in the slide. Um, and those are, there's many, many different types. There's ones that just spin. There's ones that rock like that one. There's ones that we call rose sprinklers that are just small metal ones that don't cost very much. You can buy at any hardware store and they have either a square pattern, rectangular, round, and you can just sort of set those in a bed and the water just kind of sprays out of them. Um, but lots of different kinds. There's ones that are like, look like a donut. They're circular. Um, tons of different things. There's even bubblers. There's ones you can put on the end of a hose. If you just want to deep soak an area, the water just bubbles out of it instead of just spraying out of the hose end. It'll bubble out more slowly and so it'll stay localized at the base of the plant that you're trying to water well. You can also install soaker hoses, which is a really good water saving measure, also a way to deep water and to um, protect water from evaporation you actually install them in the beds and typically cover them with mulch so that they are um, intact under the, under the mulch and close to the soil. You have to make sure that they cover all the area where plant roots might be. So you can't just put like one line in a big bed. It's not gonna go very far. It'll only go you know a couple feet from, from the hose itself. So you need to cover the bed. And sometimes, Raccoons are wise to these and have dug them up and, and trying to get to the water. So putting little pans of water in your yard can forestall that and keep them away from your soaker hoses. Um, drip systems are more sophisticated system um, that can be installed into beds. And both of these can be uh, set up with timers and drip systems can be drip tape that just drips out water. They could be, they could have little emitters that spray like a, you know, irrigation system would, or they can, be, there's variations on that um, and lots of ways to do that. And there, there are several companies online that have great products that you can look at and learn and they will help you um, decide what works best. These can work even if you have a cluster of containers to put drip uh, systems into them and then just, you can hook it up to the hose. You can leave it hooked up and have it just come on with the timer or you can just hook it up as needed. And then when you're doing other things, you can let your garden be watered um, while you're busy taking care of other things. And then of course, hand watering. Uh, I hand water a lot because I like to look at my plants and I have lots of containers. And so I use that method a lot. Um, I typically use a hose with a nozzle on the end, like this little dog has in its mouth. Um, and I like the ones with multiple settings so I can, and also ones with on and off valves so I can control the water pressure and have it for small 
pots less harsh than if I trying to fill a really big five, you know, 15 gallon pot that has a tomato in it. Um, I want it, the water to come out faster. Um, but watering cans are useful if you're trying to fertilize. You can add like liquid fish fertilizers, fertilizers or kelp meal fertilizers to that and um, hand water things. So typically I'll use those when I'm trying to nourish something. I'll get the plant wet and then I'll come back and I'll do a watering with a fertilizer. And then how to water. So there's, you know, people typically say, how do I know how much to give a plant? Well, it just depends. It depends on your soil, depends on what it's, is it in a pot? Is it in the sun, in the shade? What plant is it? Does it need more water than, you know, a hosta might need more water than a lavender. Um, but our rule of thumb really is feel the soil until you get to know your particular garden and what the soil's doing you need to check. So you wanna feel if it's cool and moist, wait till the next day. Unless it's a plant, of course, it needs a ton of moisture. So you can give it a little water, but you also don't wanna overwater because you can kill plant roots by um, you know, drowning them essentially. You also wanna water slowly. So you wanna allow the soil to absorb water. When I'm watering my containers, I go, I make a pass through three of them. And I have, like I said, a lot of containers. So I'll do three big containers and then I'll start with the first one again and go back over it. And then I'll do it again. And typically I do about three rounds and let the water really soak in. I wanna see the water coming out of the bottom of the pot. Mine are sitting on gravel or in a garden bed. I don't need to worry about you know, water collecting. And even when I'm watering a house plant, I let the water sit in the, in the tray because that actually adds humidity to the air um, and is helpful for houseplants. So I don't worry about that. It gets reabsorbed back into the soil by the end of the day. You wanna um, water deeply to encourage deep plant roots because the deeper the plant roots are, the more water they can find for themselves. And also um, they aren't gonna be um, drying out quite as quickly. They're not gonna be as prone to dehydration. Um, when soil is very dry, if you let it dry out too much, it becomes hydrophobic. You may have seen soil pull away from the edges of pots and when you water, the, the water just goes down the sides of the pot. So sometimes you need to sort of stir that back up again, um, water it a couple times and then come back maybe an hour later and water again where the water will absorb better and you may wanna even add a little compost to it at that point to help it hold the water. Um, you want to make sure you're watering the entire bed and when you're doing containers, be thorough, go around all sides of the pot, don't just water from one point, because there are roots all around in the pot and there are roots all around in the bed, so water everything, you don't know where the roots are going in a bed, they could be going under your lawn even, you know, it depends on what the plant is. Hoses that have been sitting in the sun could have hot water. Um, so let it run for a second, test it to make sure it's cool enough to not burn your plant roots. And then if you're using, uh, if you're um, growing edibles, be sure to use lead-free hoses. Water is a great solvent and it will uh, actually carry metals, heavy metals, and a and lot of hoses are, have lead in them. And so if you are letting it sit in the sun and you didn't like let all the water drain out, um, water could be sitting there with a bunch of lead in it that you then spray onto your plants. Uh, for irrigation systems that, that you set up that are either built in the ground or the soaker hoses or drip, you can use a smart timer. It can shut off on rainy days or cloudy days. You can have ones that have multiple settings for each station so you can deal with that um, issue of soil um, being hydrophobic. You let it run for 10 minutes and then you go through each station for 10 minutes, then it comes back and does a 20 minute watering. And that way you're gonna get better watering um, for your plants. I used to work at Seattle City Light as a gardener and this is what we did with our stations. We did a, a short um, round on every station and then we came back and did a longer setting and our plants did really well with that. Um, you, can, you can get nozzles that have lots of settings. So I prefer this shower setting that you see in the picture. That's the one I use the most, but there are times when I might want a gentler spray or 
um, maybe I'm trying to reach further and I'm gonna, you know, I'm watering something in the ground and so I can be a little more forceful and I can use a, a jet spray or something different. But there's lots of different settings on these that help. And then um, shutoff valves are super important, as I said, to control the flow of water so you don't have to use, um, you don't have to have as much pressure on what you're trying to put on the soil. And you can also turn it off as you move from place to place. So you're not watering. In my case, I'd be watering the gravel driveway and the sidewalk as I move around areas of my garden uh, that don't need it or my patio in the back. Um, so lots of different things. There's also, you can make your own water bottles um, using like, if you drink juice or um, milk in plastic cartons, um, typically ones, you know, milk jugs aren't quite as good as like, um the juice like orange juice bottles that you can grab onto and have a um, screw on a big screw on lid you can poke holes in those lids and then you fill it with water and you can turn it upside down and use it as a watering uh, bottle um, small water bottles work really well for seedlings so if you are trying to start things this time of year um, in little seedling packs um, those bottles are really useful for this as opposed to a hose end sprayer like this that you'd have to really shut down really pretty tight to get a, a, a gentle spray of water or turn on the water, barely turn the water on. So the water bottles work well because you just squeeze them a little and jet, little jet streams of water come out, but they're very gentle and you can water seeded uh, areas very easily or little seedlings without hurting them. All right, so now. You know, we've been doing all this work all summer. We've been, you know, eating out of our garden and we want to be able to make sure we're getting the best out of our harvest. So, you know, you want to think about, you know, what should be in season right now. Now, I know a lot of people are harvesting tomatoes. I just started getting them in the last week and a half. Um, I, where my tomatoes are, the lilac across the driveway has grown up too tall and I'm going to be pruning that down this weekend. Um, so I have more shade there than I used to, so I'm not getting as many tomatoes this year as I have in the past. But uh, in the areas where there's some good sun, I'm starting to see my shishito peppers develop pretty well. And um, I have a lemongrass plant out there and those tomatoes and I have herbs and flowers. And, you know, there's different things I'm going to be harvesting at different times. So all crops have a different day to maturity and even within a type of crop. So like a tomato, we typically tell people to grow things that are gonna take, you know, from 60 to 80 days here, ideally. You can push that window to 85 to 90, especially if you can get them out earlier in May and protect them if there's chilly nights. Um, but you wanna be aware that we have a you know, window of time when certain things can grow if they're hot weather crops. And then we have this very long window where you can do all these um, short season and cool weather crops. So we can start planting in March, sometimes in February, depends on the year, um, certain things. Peas are pretty darn hardy. Um, so you can have a lot of things coming to maturity at different times during the year. But right now we're kind of in the full blown part of the season, especially with all those fruiting plants um, that we put in that we're harvesting from all summer long. Um, you need to know what it's supposed to look like. Does it need to be fully developed? Sometimes you people, you'll see on seed packets for lettuce, oh, it's gonna take 30 days for baby greens and 45 for a fully mature head of lettuce. So you can harvest it sooner, um, if it's something that you can eat young, um, and that's fine. Does it need to change color, you know, like a tomato um, or a green pepper? Is it gonna be a green pepper? Is it gonna be a red pepper? Um, does it need to open and flower or do you really not want that flower to open so that you can cut it before it opens um, and goes past its prime? Some things die back first. You know, what part are you harvesting? Are you harvesting the leaf? the root, the flower, you know, the shoots on it, what is, what is your goal? And you wanna know when it's passing its prime and going to seed or bolting, you know, that's the term we all use for that. There's a lot of short season plants 
like radishes and mustard and spinach and lettuces. Lettuces are a little longer, but they will bolt. And so I had a few that did that, my um, butterhead lettuces. I got all my romaines out and then I missed a few of the butterheads, but I'm letting them go to seed. I'm gonna see what I collect out of them. Um, on a seed packet, you can see a lot of information and then it will tell you when, um, how many days to maturity. Um, so on the top here, it says kale red Russian and it says frost tolerant 50 days. So in early spring or late summer. So here we are, it's late summer. You know, we're, we're at that point where it's good. You could put this directly in the garden, but it'd be great to be able to actually tend to it well and grow a nice little start that you set out later this, this um, summer and fall. So kale can overwinter. You can be planting it now to grow through next spring and then you get an earlier crop. It's also a biennial and it will flower. The stuff that you planted this spring, if you weave in the garden all winter, which you can, will flower next spring. If you put things in this fall, sometimes they'll flower, but a lot of times you'll get an early crop out of them uh, first, and then they'll flower later, and maybe not. Um, you can actually grow these guys as little seedlings. A lot of times people use these as a mix and just grow a bunch of really uh, small, almost like growing microgreens, but in your garden bed, you just do like a, a mix of um, different kinds of greens that you harvest for lettuces or for um, braising, you know, to, to cook um, on the stove top. So seed packets have a ton of info, tells you how many days to harvest. And that 50 days is if you're waiting for it to get mature enough to be able to pick leaves off of it. You might harvest the whole plant. Typically with kale, we don't. We just start at the bottom and start picking the leaves. And then on the right, you see a lettuce that's already going past its prime. When lettuce starts to bolt, it gets more bitter. It's in a chicory, um, related to chicories and radicchio. And so like those plants, they always have a little bit of bitterness. Lettuce will get a little bitter. It's still edible. If you like that bitter flavor, go ahead and eat it. But what's happening here is it's sending up its flowering stalk. And so this is, you'll start to see it. And after a while, you'll notice um, what they're supposed to look like before um, they bolt. You'll start to see this starting to happen even before it's as obvious as this. They change form a little bit and you'll get to know based on what you grow when something's getting ready to bolt. Cilantro will bolt pretty quickly as well, but in the case of cilantro, it's okay because the flowers are important and they will reseed themselves. All right, so here's just we're gonna look, talk about different veggies and then we're gonna look at a few pictures. So for fruiting plants, you know, you want it to be fully farmed and ripe for the variety. So if it's a tomato, what color is it supposed to be? <coughs> Green and purple fruit are harder to identify the ripeness of. Green fruit in particular, um, they sometimes get a little darker, sometimes a little paler. You can feel it. So a, a tomato that's not quite ready is going to be harder than a tomato that is ripe. But, you know, when you go to the grocery store, if they're really soft, you know, they're pretty ripe and sometimes too ripe. And so you can test that. But for some of the plants like this little indigo pear tomato in the picture, you can definitely see the green as opposed to it's turning orange. And with something like indigo rose, which is a round purple tomato, the side that's out of the sun that doesn't get sunlight is usually green. And the, you may be one little spot. And then the rest of it's a very dark kind of reddish purple. And you can't tell it'll look exactly the same when it's ripe as when it's not. Um, except that, that little green spot will turn red. So when it's ready, if you're looking at the shady side of the plant, you can see that it's hat turned color. And so this is just an example of one that is a little more obvious. This is in the indigo family as well. These were developed on um, <coughs> Oregon State University as tomatoes that have a lot of anthocyanins in them, which are really good um, antioxidants for you and good you know, for can um, cancer prevention. And so these guys 
um, have this really, really dark pigment. And there's a whole series of them, cherry tomatoes, regular sized tomatoes um, with all different kinds of names, indigo cherry, indigo pear, and then indigo rose is the original. Um, peppers are kind of similar. Um, a lot of them, you know, you're eating in the green stage, but your goal is to get them red or yellow, perhaps. So for instance, a paprika pepper, you're going to want to get to the red stage so that you can get the best flavor out of it. And then you're going to take it and dry it and grind it up and have paprika. Um, other peppers, you know, like a jalapeno, we typically eat green. But if you let them go to red, they may be a little hotter. So it depends on how you like them as well. Um, so peppers are pretty variable. Um, and then zucchini and other summer squash, as we know, are best when picked when smaller. Um, you know, you want them less than a foot. Those smaller, like six inch zucchini are pretty delicious and tender. There's not as many seeds in them. They're still edible when they're bigger. A lot of times bigger ones you can like um, core and stuff and, you know, put veggies inside, other veggies or meat inside of them and, and bake them like you would a, a pepper, you know, if you're doing um, peppers in the oven with ground beef, you can do that with big zucchinis if you let them go too long. They're easy to have happen because especially zucchini, because they hide, uh, they're the same color as the plant and they're easy to not see. Um, so you need to be checking on them. Once they start producing, they produce a lot and really quickly. <clears throat> Often the blossom is withered on the fruit. So just withered. Um, if you still see a full flower, it's not quite ready. It's still edible, but you can get it a little bit bigger. And then winter squash and pumpkins generally are picked after vines die back. If you ever go out to pumpkin patches, usually the vines are dead and you're out there picking the pumpkins. They benefit from a little touch of cold weather. That skin needs to harden off so it can be kept. Um, they're not like summer squash that have that thin skin. They actually have a harder skin that helps, um, it makes it able for you to keep them and store them. And then melons, you know, everybody's always bumping on melons at the, at the grocery store. That's one way to tell. Um, they do have a little bit different sound, um, but they often separate but, um, both like cantaloupes and honeydew and watermelons, all three will separate from the stem a little bit, that stem starts to dry up a bit and it's not quite as thick and, and you know green as it was when it was attached to the plant. Um, but often with cantaloupe, the netting becomes more prominent. So musk melon or a type of cantaloupe, and you'll see that, or cantaloupe or a type of musk melon, you'll see that netting be very prominent. It, be, it becomes maybe a little less, um, maybe a little creamier colored uh, the skin and then the netting is very obvious. Watermelon also where it touches the ground, it's kind of like these tomatoes, you know, this part that's out in the sun is getting that full effect from the sunlight and developing its skin. But that part that touches the ground isn't getting the same light and it can, it'll be paler. But when it becomes more kind of yellowish or cream colored, then usually the watermelon is, is ripe. Um, berries become fully colored, and this is true about pretty much all of them. You can see some really subtle variations, you know, when the blueberry gets darker, when the strawberry gets a really, really vivid red. Um, you don't want them to go too far or they, you know, they get, they start to, um, if they start to decay, they start to um, break down and then you get less sweetness out of them. Um, but this is pretty much true of all berries. You can eat them when they're less ripe, but they taste best when they're fully colored and but still firm. And then okra is another one of those like zucchini, you want it to be small. You don't want big, long okras because they get woody and they, you know, the shell is really hard and there isn't as much inside of it. Seedy, you get a seedy and woody shell um, okra and it's, that's not anybody's um, delight. And I love okra. I know a lot of people don't care about it, but I think they are delicious. And I love them like with zucchini and tomatoes or, or green beans sort of sauteed together. And then there's lots of tree fruit. There's a million different kinds of apples. There's some ripe now. 
um, but you need to know what the right color is for those guys, like what color are they supposed to be when they're ripe. And um, pears generally we pick and let ripen on the counter. And um, you know, that's these are both sort of knowing your varieties and when you're supposed to pick them. So here's some pictures of what I was talking about. So there's a zucchini. You can see one of those has the withered blossom that's ready to go. The other ones, they're starting to wilt. You know, once the, you know, those are edible right then. Some of them are bigger than others, but that's about right, the right stage. You let them go too much longer, they're gonna get really big. And if you wait, if you didn't wait this long, you're gonna get a really small fruit. Um, there's the watermelon with that kind of golden yellow creamy um, side that was touching the ground. Um, they propped us up for this picture so that we could see it. Uh, peppers, you can see the various colors. These are edible at any of these stages. And so sometimes you'll buy a pepper that says rainbow pepper because you'll see it go from green to yellow to orange to red and you can eat it in any of those stages. And sweet peppers, the more color, the deeper the color, the sweeter it's gonna be. You know, red peppers are generally sweeter than um, a green pepper, um, but they're all delicious at different stages. And then the winter squash, the delicata squash is, you know, the vines dying back on it. Um, you want it, because you want it to have as much nutrient as it can get, but once it's, once it's dying back, it's severed its connection and, and you just want it to uh, the skin to sort of harden up for you. And then the okra, you know, you don't want them too much bigger than what you're seeing here, a little bit more, but that's about it. And if you're growing okra, they are hard to produce in this region in the Northwest, but you can get them going early enough with cloching, you can get a little bit of a crop, but you need a few plants to really make a, you know, a showing so that you get enough something to eat. All right, so when you're harvesting um, leaves and flowers, um, it just depends on what it is. What's the part of the plant that you're eating? With garlic, you can harvest scapes if they're hard neck varieties, um, but for both hard and soft neck, you're harvesting bulbs. Um, you planted these as a clove and it grew another bulb. So it essentially you take a bulb, you break it up into cloves, you plant it, and then you're getting if you planted 12 cloves, you're gonna get 12 bulbs and now you have 12 times you know, as many um, bulbs. So you wanna get it when it's starting to die back or when the tops have died down. Um, and that's when you harvest it and you let it cure a little bit. And that's what you're seeing on the picture on the right. <clears throat> With onions, green onions, you can pick at any stage. Um, you wanna get them before they flower typically. And usually it can sometimes take two seasons for them, but they can, if you plant them early enough in the spring, they might um, flower later in the summer. Uh, so be picking those kind of continually and you can plant them continually too. But bulbing onions, you wanna get when the tops die back and then lettuce, and like that picture, you want it to look beautiful like this and not elongated. And you can see none of these are looking elongated yet. Um, greens, it's the same, um, you know, some of them will head up and some won't. Uh, things like kale or chard, you want to start picking when the leaves are large enough to trim and still have enough of a plant to continue to grow. And so that could happen as early as June and goes all through the fall and maybe over the winter. And then broccoli is a flower. So you're picking the flower head when it's tight in the bud before they open. If you were to let that go, it's going to become yellow flowers. And then it's pretty, it's still edible. The uh, flowers are edible on all of these, but um, you really want the, the best uh, harvest to be from that head. Um, if you're looking at roots, you can see in that middle picture, potato beds that the vines are dying down and then they're ready to start um, digging up. You can harvest them as baby potatoes when they're still growing. They typically flower and then the plants start to die back. Um, and then carrots, you can thin and grow, eat as they grow. So the picture of carrots here, you see them nicely planted far apart. You know, typically when I plant carrots, I have many, many more carrots in my row and I've harvested by this point, I've harvested out all those younger ones. So you can eat them at baby sizes throughout the season. You can also eat the greens of carrots. They can be cooked and eaten. Um, radishes are like beets. Um, you're gonna, and like carrots, you can just kind of see the tops. 
uh, become visible when they're starting to um, really bulb up and you have something able to pull. And radishes grow in cooler weather. Um, so you can start um, planting those again soon and um, they will grow into the fall. They're very fast, take about a month. You can cook the greens and you can make it into pesto, which I've done and frozen. And then um, beets are delicious when they're really small or you can let grow large roots and then also eat the tops. So you can be like chard, you can be picking greens off your beets for a while while they're still growing roots on them. And then of course we have lots of herbs in the garden. So harvesting leafy herbs, um, it's good to get them before they flower. Uh, to get the best oils. This is true for lavender too. You want them tight in the bud. And this uh, little graphic from getbusygardening.com was a really perfect example. So you see some that have already open and they're already going to seed, but you want these tight flowers to get the best oils and to save them if you're gonna like make potpourri or make uh, use them to put into food. Um, they can flavor sugar nicely. They um, can make reeds with them, but you want them tight in the bud. And then leafy herbs like cilantro, basil, parsley, shiso, um, the, you need those things that are annuals, don't live over, but you're using those, those soft leaves. You can harvest whole, you can harvest pieces of throughout the summer um, and use them fresh. You can make them into pesto, which I do with my basil every year. And then I freeze it in ice cube trays like you see here. But what this is, is parsley and oil. And so you can use olive oil or any kind of oil that you like and put fresh leafy leaves into the oil and freeze them. And then you take these and put them in bags and you have this wonderful um, oil um, infused with parsley to cook with during the winter. Woody herbs that are perennial and are shrubby, you can just trim when you need fresh or you can trim pieces and hang them and dry them and, and then have them in jars to be able to use later. Herbs are one of the more fun things to harvest because there's so many different things you can do with them. All right, so we're gonna talk quickly about um, crop succession. Um, this is a little chart that comes in the link that I gave Elizabeth a bunch of links. One of them is growing food in the city. And this is a brochure that Seattle Public Utilities um, created with uh, the pea patch program and with the garden hotline and we all participated in adding to this but it has this wonderful little planting calendar that kind of shows you when you put plants out when you put seeds out when you transplant things when you can start harvesting something what can overwinter and so it's a good um, beginning gardening sort of uh, review of um, what can be happening in the garden like right now you can be planting peas right now if you want to um, I plant them often in early October because I like my crop in the spring in particular. And so I will put them in in early October because typically in March, when I'm able to plant peas in my garden, I'm so busy at work that I never get them in. So if I do them in October, then it's done and I get that spring crop. It's just gonna come up a little earlier. They're pretty hardy, they overwinter well. Green onions will overwinter. Bulbing onions, not so much. So they have a shorter season, which is why I wanted to show that in contrast. But sometimes people leave them in the ground and mulch them over. Like you can leave root crops also to mulch over. And then you can be pulling them later in the season. Um, but root crops, you can be planting all from April through August. And leafy greens have a really long season. And cilantro is so short that you can even be seeding some in September. So this chart is really useful. Um, the Tilt Alliance Garden Guide also has month by month measures of what to do, when, and when to seed, when to close, when to plant directly, when to plant transplants, uh, lots of information out there. If you're gonna save seeds, you need to sometimes sacrifice a plant. Um, on a tomato, you don't, you're just sacrificing a fruit or a couple of fruits that you're gonna, um, select. Uh, some things will cross pollinate um, and you need open pollinated crops because if you have a hybrid that means it's already been crossed. So there's two parent varieties to a hybrid and you don't know which parent you will get from your um, seed. 
you could get one or the other, but it's going to revert. It's not going to be that hybrid plant because it takes a lot of manipulation. And this is not genetic manipulation. This is just basic plant breeding where they are, you know, putting pollen together to get the plants cross pollinate. Um, it takes several generations to get the plant that we plant that's a hybrid plant. And they do that for a reason because they're often more disease resistant or they produce better. They're more winter hardy. There's a lot of reasons why hybrids can be a useful plant. You see that a lot in squashes and, and uh, cabbage family as in particular. Um, but you'll see lots of open pollinated lettuces and tomatoes. They're easy to save. They have completely different methods of saving, which we're not going to go into today, but one is a wet method. And then with lettuce, it's just dry. You let them grow and develop and collect the dry seeds. Um, lettuce don't tend to cross pollinate as well. They're self pollinating. Um, they will, they can cross pollinate and you might get something different. It's still going to be a good lettuce. So it doesn't really matter if you develop something new, you get something new. Um, but often we may only have one lettuce in our yard. And so the ones I have seeding now, that's the only one out there. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to get the plant that I planted. Um, you have to sacrifice that plant. So they are going to seed, I'm not eating them. I need them to be as strong and, and viable as possible so they can develop a good seed crop. Um, you wanna choose the ones that performed well here. So you can develop plants that do really well in your own personal yard. And then if you need to isolate them, so in the case of this tomato, it was isolated um, early on and then you can hand pollinate them so that you can control what's um, what pollen is actually getting to that so you can get the plant that you want because tomatoes will cross pollinate easily. Here's some great um, resources for seed saving and learning more about it. Um, the organic seed grower guide is from um, I think from Johnny's seed and then the seed to seed um, book is uh, that's available pretty much anywhere. Um, Whoops, that's from Seed Savers. And then also this other one is from Seed Savers Exchange. And this organization actually sells seeds. So you can just deal with them like they're a seed company and buy seed. They're in the Midwest, um, but they carry seed that is good everywhere, um, all over the United States. And you can join them as an organization and then share seed with each other. So you could find people in your region that can share seed with you. You can try seeds from the Southwest if you want to experiment. Um, there, are, there are some organizations that do, like in Arizona, that are doing Southwest native seed saving. Um, but those aren't going to be as practical for the Northwest, but you can always try them. You can sort of play around and try different things. And the, the reason this is important is these folks are protecting seed diversity. A lot of seed companies, We've lost a lot of genetic diversity because they're focusing on, you know, just certain seeds rather than all the different kinds of seeds we used to have. And that's why open pollinated seeds are important as well. So if you're looking at an ornamental garden, what are you doing for fall and winter? Well, lots of things. You know, you could be mulching right now while the weather's nice so that you don't have to do it in the rain in October. Um, you can be developing ideas and plans for where you want to plant new things. Fall is a great time to plant. There's often plant sales um, in the fall because not only are people getting rid of inventory, but they actually bring plants in in the fall in the nurseries because we get cooler weather, the uh, rains are happening, plants, especially woody shrubs and trees, will develop a stronger root system. Um, if you plant in the fall because the roots will continue to grow while the plant is more dormant and then it puts a lot of energy into a strong root system which makes for a stronger plant next year. Um, if you like um, annual color, um, like I always have pots of flowers around, you can start transitioning from summer to winter and the uh, pansies, you know, will go all through the winter. For fall, you can have chrysanthemums on your porch you know, some of those ornamental kales and cabbages. There's lots of things, but pansies are my favorite because I can actually have them and plant them in other parts of my yard later next, next summer and have them for years to come. Now's the time to order bulbs. I just ordered bulbs from two different companies. Um, so a lot of planning going on right now, just like we do in early 
uh, you know, January, February, this is a good time also to be planning for what you're going to do this fall. Um, if you're going to do any lawn renovation tasks, September is the time to do that. Fertilizing the lawn is important in September. Be prepared. And then if you want, if you need to prune things, know what can be pruned this time of year. Not everything can or should be. Hot weather is really dangerous to be pruning in. You can sun scald leaves that have been in the shade if you expose them. So you just want to be careful. And you want to water well if you're going to prune something to avoid stress. But fruit trees, you can take off those water sprouts and suckers and hedges are pruned usually in the summer to keep them from, you know, because they're not going to, this time of year, they're not going to try and grow back as vigorously. Um, but anytime you prune, you do trigger a hormonal response in the plant to try and grow again. So you just want to be sure you're pruning the right thing um, right now. And then this is the hotline. So this is who you can contact if you have questions. These are our sponsors. This is the Pickering Barn Garden that I mentioned that we used to manage. This little green roof on the tool shed. And this is um, cat mint, not catnip, but cat mint, which is a perennial in the mint family. Fabulous pollinator plant. Um, it's in the berm uh, on the street side uh, by the sidewalk. And um, we had tons of really interesting plants, native plants and a lot of uh, great pollinator and um, beneficial insect plants there. If you wanna call us, uh, we have a phone, we're there Monday through Saturday. We have the email at help at gardenhotline.org. There's also a form on the hotline website and there's lots of articles there, links to the um, brochures, the ones I sent Elizabeth to share and also just others. Um, that you can access. And then there's also a list of all the classes we're doing, including this one was there, up there. And um, you can see where else we're gonna be. We'll be in person in the Canton um, Woodmont Libraries this um, fall and all summer and fall. I think I'll be there not next week, but the week after down in Kent doing a microgreens class if you wanna come in person. And then we're also gonna be up in the Richmond Beach and um, Shoreline Libraries. Um, or Kenmore, Kenmore and Richmond Beach libraries in the fall. So we, we get out and about. We do programming with um, immigrant and refugee groups in their community gardens, um, with garden clubs, um, and with uh, master gardeners as well. So if you have any questions, feel free. Thank you so much, Laura. I always learn so much from your presentations. And um, I know that everyone watching here live or on the replay also very much appreciates your expertise. Oh, and uh, Mary said, thank you. Much useful information. Well, right. thank you, Mary, for being Mary, where are you from? Where do you live? Um, I'm in Central Way. Around the corner oh, from morning. Awesome. Yay. Perfect. Yeah, um, we come, we come down to the tool library sometimes and do classes. And then sometimes for the city of Federal Way, we've done programming too. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have ever-bearing strawberries that they're just starting their second round. Um, any tips on caring for them? Um, you know, you kind of do the same you would with any strawberry, you know, trim dead leaves off. Um, if you if you're getting runners, you know, replanting those strawberries benefit from sort of being refreshed every couple of years. Um, you know, you can have a plant for a few years and then it will have less production. And so, you know, saving some of those younger ones um, and trading them out with the older ones and just keeping them sort of refresh that way is what I do. Keeping them well watered right now. Um, I have mine in a big tower, um, that one of those plastic towers that you put together that have sort of a little, looks like a big flower almost. It's got little um, compartments that the soil's in and they stack on top of each other. And then when they're stacked, there's the top is, you know, just open soil. And then the sides are little pockets that things are growing out of. And so my, they love that thing, um, but I have to make sure that I keep it, even that pl black plastic, you know, it's, it's a lot of soil, even that dries out pretty easily. So 
Um, that's my challenge with it is making sure I water it well enough. Um, you can always also fertilize them, um, you know, using um, fish fertilizer early in the season that when they're getting growing uh, to, to stimulate the green growth. And then, you know, if yours are fruiting right now, I wouldn't do that so much, but kelp fertilizers, you can get like seaweed fertilizers that's liquid. You can put in a watering can and water a little bit. Those are helpful right now because it's hot and they're trying to produce. Um, so that's what I would do. Thank you. I love strawberries. I had one this so this summer. You know, I mean, I had a crop earlier, but right now, one of my plants, and I ha I know I have a mix of strawberries in there. I don't even know what kinds they are anymore. They're different. So one of those was a repeat performer, but it only gave me one more berry. <laughs> oh shoot! <laughs> I know. Yeah, I just, um, I was a little bit late to the um, starting my seeds in the uh, greenhouse. So um, luckily I was able to get some really great um, uh, garden starts from uh, Westwind, Westwind Gardens um, Planet Wise uh, plant starts. And we sell them at both, both, Marlene's locations and um it it was really wonderful to see how the development of soil plays a role yeah in the the growth factor I have um two clawfoot tubs one of them had better soil than the other that's fun clawfoot tubs Oh, did I lose you guys? Uh oh, hey Mary, I think we lost uh, Elizabeth. I'm still here. Yeah, I think she got kicked. She was having a lot of technical issues earlier, so it looks like she she lost our connection. That happened to me the last time. <laughs> I was talking and I wasn't talking to you guys anymore. <laughs> Is there anything um, in particular that you could say about? helping tomatoes to ripen um you know making sure they're not too shaded right now so like mine like i mentioned mine that lilac is shading mine so my plants didn't get very robust they're kind of skinny which actually is to their benefit all the fruit is in the sun and so um make if you have a really robust plant trimming off some of the bigger leaves where the tomatoes are maybe underneath them can help with that. Uh, also, we're almost to the point, if you have a, a cherry tomato that is, um, you know, the indeterminate type that keeps producing fruit forever, if you were, you know, if it could grow forever, um, you want to start removing flowers at some point. Um, not yet, because there's still time for those to develop. But after a while, you start pulling the flowers off like late August, early September, so that the fruit that's there will finish um, rather than um, it trying to put energy into making new fruit. Okay. And then um, a lot of people say to actually, um, oh, she sent me a message, say to, to hold off watering. Um, but I don't subscribe to that philosophy because water can stress your tomato and you can get blossom end rot, you know, where you um, you see those sort of brown spots on the end of the tomato, like the brown 
Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen that before. Um, <clears throat> because uh, in uneven watering will cause that to happen and too dry of soil because the plant can't get calcium. And, and then it starts, if it loses calcium, it can't um, develop the fruit properly. And so um, that can happen. So keeping them consistently moist, keeping uh -huh. the fruit from being too shaded and then pulling those flowers off after a while, are kind of the main, main things to do right now. You can also use that um, seaweed fertilizer on them um, because that helps with stress. It's hot and dry right now. Okay. So it looks like she just lost us and it's just you and me and we can wrap up if you're ready. Yeah, I think, I think I've think i got a lot of information. So thank you. Great. And give us a call if you ever have any questions. That's what we're there for. I will. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Mary. Bye. Bye.